Well, thank you for returning. We continue to talk about the subject and getting into some more practical areas on how to help a single person. <clears throat> Let me start off with this introduction of three examples <clears throat> of people not wanting to get involved or perhaps not knowing what to do. First example, a young woman was, and these are all true stories, a young woman was brutally attacked as she returned to her apartment late one night. <clears throat> she screamed and shrieked as she fought for her life, yelling until she was hoarse for 30 minutes as she was beaten and abused. 38 people watched the half-hour episode in rapt fascination from their windows. <clears throat> Not one so much as walked over to the telephone and called the police. She died that night at 30, as 38 witnesses stared in silence. Another example was similar. Riding on a subway, a 17-year-old youth was quietly minding his own business when he was stabbed repeatedly in the stomach by attackers. Eleven riders watched the stabbing, stabbing, but none came to assist the young man. <clears throat> Even after the thugs had fled and the train had pulled out of the station, he laid there in a pool of his own blood. Not one of the eleven came to his side. Less dramatic but equally shocking was the ordeal of a woman in New York City. While shopping on Fifth Avenue in busy Manhattan, this woman tripped and broke her leg. Dazed, anguished, and in shock, she called out for help, not for two minutes, not for 20, but for 40 minutes as shoppers and business executives, students and merchants walked around her and stepped over her, completely ignoring her cries. After literally hundreds had passed by, a cab driver finally pulled over, hauled her into his taxi, and took her to a local hospital. In these true stories, what do you think prevented people from helping? Fear of being assaulted? Not knowing how to help? Believing their efforts would make no difference? Not wanting to get involved? Uncomfortable? Awkward, inconvenience, it's not my problem. Someone more qualified to assist. These responses sound pathetic in retrospect, but are very real when you are thrown in the throes of the trauma. I believe that when someone brings the sin of masturbation to light and is seeking help, we respond similarly with superficial, pithy cliches. We advise the person to pray about it, to get involved in a small group or support group, or we'll give them a book to read and offer to meet with them if they want to call and schedule a time, perhaps praying all the while that they won't call. We'll see them in church and ask them how they are doing, to which they respond, fine because the timing of the question is not conducive to the environment, hindering in-depth honesty. We may even begin to see this person on a regular basis, feel excited and energized, reading favorite scriptures and pumping up their spirits. But week after week, he returns defeated and discouraged. Like a tire with a slow leak, we blow in some Bible verses and hope next week he will feel better. You might be saying to yourself right now, Rick, you sure seem pessimistic. What else can a person do in cases like this? It's tough, and it's not the easiest sin to deal with. And I ask what sin is. If we don't biblically practically and rele relevant, uh, relevantly provide solid answers, they will find other avenues for help. All they have to do is go to www.amazon.com and click on self-help. They will find 
26,000 options and counting. Or they can go to www.barnesnoble.com and find 38,000 self-help options and counting. We need to be reminded that God has given us everything pertaining to life, how to be saved, and godliness, how to live saved. This lesson is a two-part lesson and is devoted to sharing tools, resources, and methodologies so you will be effective in helping those who masturbate. I will present them in the following fashion. Christ calls us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul and strength. If the object of our affections, energies, and focus does not love the Lord in this way, then we love something or someone else, which is called idolatry. Therefore, masturbation is a matter of self-worship. The person involved in masturbation loves himself with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Research and reflection on this concept shows numerous different resources in each of these areas to restore the object of worship to the Lord God. Let me state that differently. There are biblical resources that can help the person who masturbates to return his heart, mind, soul, and strength to loving God rather than himself. Before suggesting these resources, I want you to know that if you're going to help people, you have a built-in starting point. It is called gathering data. And this is crucial. If you are going to help the person effectively glorify God in his body, we must ask questions, record answers, ask questions from those answers, record more answers, study the answers, identify the performance problem issues, and look for the preconditioning process problems. If we fail to execute meticulously this task, the best we can hope for and the best we can offer to the person is behavioral modification. So let's talk about gathering data. What kind of data <clears throat> am I looking for? I would encourage you to have some type of form. We use a form called PDI, Personal Data Inventory, that asks a series of questions in a variety of areas of the person's life. Let me provide a sample list of some questions. When did the person first become involved in masturbating? What were the circumstances? What was the frequency when he first started? What is the frequency now? What was the stimulus when he first started? Where did he find or get the stimulus? What is the stimulus now? Where does he find or get the stimulus now? Is the stimulus visual, pictures, etc., mental, fantasy, emotional, loneliness, dating frustrations? What media influences are present? Does he watch a lot of prime time television? Does he rent questionable videos? Does he subscribe to cable? Does he have internet access? What is the purpose of the internet access? Does he receive pornographic emails? Does he have blockers or security devices on his computer? Is he married? Is there regular intimacy with his spouse? Is he single? Is he dating? Is he engaged? Is he sexually active with this person? whether he's dating or engaged. We need to continue by addressing the person's heart and the heart reveals motivation. The word motivation comes from the Latin word that means to move. It pictures someone with inner drive, impulse and intentions. Motivation is the causation for a particular course of action is what drives a person to, to be the best in the classroom, sports, education, and vocation, etc. Motivation is central to all of life. 
it determines why you do what you do. Someone wrote a fable about a dog who loved to chase other animals. He bragged about his great running skill and said he could catch anything. Well, it wasn't long before his boastful claims were put to the test by a certain rabbit. With ease, the little creature outran his barking pursuer. The other animals watching with glee began to laugh. The dog excused him, however, by saying, you forget, I was only running for fun. He was running for his life. That does make a difference. Motivation is the most important factor in everything we do. When we speak of the heart, we are not referring to the organ that sustains breath and life. The heart is used to represent desire or focus. In the Hebrew literature, the word heart refers to the hub of life, that which is central to life, significant, meaningful. When working with someone enslaved to masturbation, it is vitally important to clarify why the person wants to deal with his sin. Many involved with masturbation have the wrong reason for stopping. Wrong motivation places the person on a slippery slope, clawing his way to the top, only to slide back into the pit of sin and despair. What are the motivations that people have for wanting to conquer masturbation? I want to stop <clears throat> masturbating so I can be free from sexual sin. I want to, I would like to feel better about myself. I desire to have a better marriage. I yearn to be a good example before my children. I need my wife to trust me again. I can't stand the guilt and the shame. I am worn out pretending to be something I am not. I'm tired of hiding. At face value, there seems to be excellent reasons why a person would want to address the masturbation issue. But let me ask you, if you were to able if you were able to provide biblical solutions to help achieve the reason cited above, do you think God has this person's heart? I would propose to you, more than likely not, the person has changed his behavior, not his motivation. What should be the motivation to abandon the sin of masturbation? Motivation is to become a fully committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 10.31 that whatever we are involved in should be done to the glory of God. The motivation is to obey Christ and glorify God. I learned this lesson very pointedly. After working with a man for a number of weeks, he was experiencing great success. He was having victory over sexual sin in his life. <clears throat> then he fell and with great remorse wept on how he wanted victory over sexual sin. For the next two months, a cycle began to develop of victory, and then sin, repentance, remorse, and resolve. I despaired in helping him, so I consulted J. Adams' 50 Failure Factors. I reviewed the numerous motivational factors to bring about change. Then it was if I was able to hear from the man was saying by the Holy Spirit, I just want to be free from sexual sin. I just want to be free from sexual sin. That was the problem. The focus was wrong. The heart was improperly motivated. What this man needed was to please God, to glorify God to obey God. When he changed the focus, things began to turn around. Another area under the worship of the heart is the concept of holiness and sanctification. I have concluded that many people struggling with life-dominating sins, especially sexual ones, have a distorted concept of the holy life. I believe this is attributed to their repeated attempts to resolve the sin issue. Now, once we recognize the cycle, we need to explain it to the person. 
The person becomes weighed down by sin. Overwhelmed by guilt, he seeks help. He begins to see a glimmer of hope that he can change. He renews his efforts to moral purity. His efforts begin to pay a dividend. He feels good about his progress. But something happens that influences a personal decision to return to masturbation. He feels defeated and resigned. He justifies his action and for a period continues in the sin. Then he becomes weighed down by the sin, overwhelmed by guilt. He seeks help and the cycle revolves. Because these people have experienced the stop and go righteousness, they come to believe that they have to live perfectly. They develop a standard of righteousness that is performance based. They measure their relationship to God as good when they remember to do everything they are supposed to do. The slightest shortfall shoves them into the valley of despair. So what's the use, they say? I might as well enjoy the sensual pleasure of masturbation. I just can't win. They have equated, they have equated sanctification with, with perfectionism. The average Christian believes in progressive sanctification. This means a process. Paul himself spoke of this progressive journey in Philippians 3, verses 8 to 14. And I encourage you to turn to that passage and read it. <clears throat> Triumphs over masturbation are momentary temptations with eternal victories. This is the sanctification process. <clears throat> we must impress upon the hearts and the minds of those wrestling with masturbation that there is no perfectionist zone that if sustained for a time results in eradication of the problem. The sin nature is ever present. The call is to faith and victory comes from obedience. Next time we get together on part two, we will talk about addressing the mind, the person's thinking, addressing the soul, the person's design, and excuse me, and addressing the strength, the person's discipline. I hope that what I share with you in this video and the next will give you practical tools and steps whereby you can help somebody that you know that is involved in this enslaving sin, that they might be set free. Tune in next time.